Okay, here we are back again. Let's see if we can get this uh, ship run for a test flight. Uh, I have made a couple of little changes since the uh, video showing the design of it. You can see one of them here, that pair of Verna's either side of the nose. Um, the main change though is just fixing the things I forgot to do in the previous video, which is mostly uh, setting up the action groups and also the tail. I'd forgotten to change the control influence on the uh, rudder so it was still trying to uh, affect roll instead of yaw, which made the plane a little bit unstable when it was coming down to altitude. Um, so anyway, let's get all the engines fired up, ready to go. Got to wait a little bit for the turbo jet to spool up, but there we go. And okay, uh, while we're running down the runway, it's a good time to set up the screens here. This is Rasta Prop Monitor that gives you these video screens, and as you can see, it really is very neat. Um, it's pretty much impossible to fly properly IVA without this sort of thing, but if you do have Rasta Prop Monitor, then you can get all the information you need uh, to fly however you like. It's a bit tricky to land from IVA, but it can be done. Um, although I don't know if I want to do it uh, live while being watched on video. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so usual, up over 0 0.3, mark 0.35, and then it's time to come up. You can see a couple of little minor stalls as I'm pulling the nose up, that little yellow warning next to the nav ball, but I'm not worried about them because that's not the entire plane stalling, it's just a particular control surface, and I'll show that here with the far visualisation you see, it's just the front cane arts that are stalling. And that's not actually a bad thing, because when a control surface stalls, it loses a lot of lift. And just you can see the drag there as well. Um, but uh, when you're going, pulling up too hard, you want the control surfaces at the front of your plane to lose lift, stall and lose lift before anything at the back, because as they lose lift, they stop pulling the nose up, which stops the plane going over further. Um, so that you know, front surface is stall first is actually a deliberate design thing. Um, what else we got? Let's set up the other sets of screens. So you've got your two seat eater here, so I usually set one up as pilot and the other one as kind of the navigator, navigator cargo officers set. So we've got contracted resources here, we've got a little camera showing the inside of the cargo bay, that's our little satellite probe you can see there. Um, and set up for a target. And you also, you can still notice here, I still haven't got my mouse pointer tracking worked out right, so everything I'm clicking at, the screen is showing you my mouse substantially off where it's actually pointing. Um, I also tried just turning the mouse off, tracking off entirely, but that doesn't appear to work either. So, yeah, still, how are we doing? So our pilots today are Bob on the left and Lodbold on the right. Uh, Bob's looking, he's usually slightly panicky self. Lodbold, I suspect, is just regretting the impending future of having to spend the next hour or so next to a screaming bob. Um, but yeah, they're doing okay. And one of the other nice things with these Mark II cockpits is they've got some very funky view options available. So you can pull back here, get a look at both guys together from behind, and if you zoom in here, you can see the raster screens are still working, still updating. You can see my fuel level going down there, intake air changing around. All good. Um, anyway, so while we've been messing about with all that, we've managed to punch up through the cloud layer. And it's still just shy of supersonic because I'm climbing at a speed that's almost but not entirely stopping my acceleration, which is usually what you want to do. This will get you out of the high drag, high danger, low altitude air before you crank up too much speed. And if you do your acceleration higher up in the thinner air, then you accelerate a lot faster anyway so you end up saving time overall. Um, I've also got it up on full time acceleration here and you can see perfectly stable. Um, it's one of the reasons I like this airframe. It means from a game player's point of view you can take it to orbit quite quickly because you just, as soon as you get out of the lower atmosphere you can crank it up to full time acceleration and do its own thing. You also see the uh, nose gradually coming down here as I'm climbing. This is kind of the space plane version of a gravity turn. It's not, I'm not putting any control inputs in here. What it is, is as we get higher, the air thins, and as the air thins, you need a greater angle of attack to maintain the same rate of climb. So it's gradually reducing my rate of climb on its own and flattening me off. Um, just straightening up here to get us back on the 90 degree bearing. You usually go a degree or two off or you're flying with time acceleration because you get you know, some little wiggles build up. Um, but 
Yeah, at about 20,000 metres is where the drag really seriously starts to get low and it's also usually where you'll be about to run out of air, as you can see I am here. Down, again, Kerbal Flight data, down to around the navball. Here's showing my air levels and just went red and I just turned off the turbo jet. So, still back in the good air again. You don't want to let your rapiers flick over to rocket mode until as late as possible. You want to get as much as you can out of the jets. But, alright, so... Now you can see sometimes too, as we, I pull the nose down and build a bit more speed, my intake gear is actually going up even though I'm still climbing. This is because the less angle of attack you have, the better your intakes work, and the faster you go, the better your intakes work. This is the ram air effect. It's the same thing as you use on a car or a motorcycle with a ram scoop. Um, it's just by pushing the air harder into the intakes and compressing it a bit, then you can yeah, you get a bit more oxygen coming through. Um, where are we now? Okay, now I'm slowly only starting to actually descend. You can see up the top on the VSI I'm dropping about 10 metres a second. I'm not at all worried about this though because, as I was explaining just before, the faster you go, and the, the, there's an interaction between altitude, speed, and the angle of attack required for level flight. So even though I'm dropping a bit, I'm gaining speed as I do it, and as I continue to gain speed, if I just hold the same pitch, then eventually the plane is going to start climbing again of its own accord. Um, and letting it do that, that gentle little dip and bounce, uh, you don't lose the speed that you would if you pulled the nose up hard to try and fight that dip. So you end up you know, getting to the same altitude at a higher speed in the same time. Um, we've got the turbo jet back on now though because we've gained enough speed that the ram air is driving that all nicely. Cruise along a little bit, starting to get a bit of atmospheric effects. Uh, I don't actually have deadly re-entry installed on, on this build because I, I usually use deadly re-entry, um, and the flight profile I'm flying here is, you know, would be deadly re-entry tolerant anyway. And oh, he's about to run out again, so turbo jet off once more. Um, uh, but uh, the recent changes in Ferrum have made deadly entry pretty much irrelevant uh, unless you uh, mess with the back end settings to make everything a lot more dangerous and I haven't got around to doing that yet. Um, it's just the, the increased skin drag in the latest version of Ferrum is slowing down to safe speeds long before you ever get to an altitude that causes any danger. Um, so hopefully you know, that'll all get sorted out soon or I could just you know, get around to going and changing the settings like I'm supposed to. Um, anyway though, you also notice I've turned on the Verners here. Uh, well, turned on the RCS, which has activated the Verners either side of the nose. It's because up in this thin air at you know, 30,000 metres or so, there's very little for the vertical stabiliser and the rudder to grip on. So this design, it does get a little bit of your instability at this height and this speed. If I was going a bit faster, it would be straighter. If I was flying a bit lower, it would be fine as well. But just this combination of speed and altitude. Okay, and now we've got the rapiers back on, but in rocket mode this time. So I turn those on before the turbo jet dies entirely because I want to use the rockets to drive extra ram air effect to get more value out of the turbo jet. Um, but we'll pull up the nose while we're doing this because after we get up to speed, we're going to be cruising for a while with engines off, and you want to do that as high as possible so you don't lose too much to friction. But again, you can see the effect of the thin air here. The plane's getting a little bit wobbly as I'm trying to pull the nose up because um, I'm not going that fast. Like this sort of altitude, 30,000 meters, you really want to be doing Mark 5 to Mark 6. Um, and I'm only doing 4.5. But the other bright bit with this sort of altitude though is that even though the thin air makes it very slippery and you wobble around a lot, the thin air also means that it's very tolerant to wobbling around. You can throw the plane nearly sideways and it's not going to rip in half like it would if you did that at low altitude at this speed because the air's so thin it's just not taking that much of a hit. But once you do get it into a, a stable pitch and position, like I have here, then hands off controls. It, it's just holding itself fine there. Um, so it's all good because we've gained a bit of speed and we've got to even thinner air. You can see the apoapsis getting over 70 there. Going to give it a bit of buffer because it's going to come down a bit due to drag losses. But yeah, engine's off, nose down to minimise the drag. I'd close the intakes when the rapiers went over to rocket mode, and where are we going? Yeah, we'll just cruise up. RCS off, because don't need it at the moment, no point wasting the fuel. 
And it looks like tanks are still about half full. Um, it's a pretty fast, flat ascent, so it won't take a lot of fuel to bring that periapsis back up. And yeah, Lodbold looks happy. How's Bob doing? Bob's still looking a bit stressed. He's not the most relaxed of pilots. Um, but yeah, the boys are doing fine though. What else have we got to go? Hmm. Yeah, not a lot to look at through the screens. Can't see much through the windscreen because we're just looking at air. Um, but yeah, I'll change this over to, there we go, orbit. I like how you see that little visual circle down in the bottom right of showing your orbit. It's quite a useful little uh, display. Anyway, up to maximum time warp, so we can just get this last you know, 15,000 metres done. Won't take very long because we're well, we were climbing at nearly a kilometre a second, it's getting to the top of the arc now, so we're starting to shallow off a bit. Um, but, yeah, while I'm doing that, what I can do is set up a manoeuvre node here. Um, I'll t if I was doing this on my own, I'd probably just get MacJib to do it automatically, because I know I know how to do this. Um, but, just pull out, set it on apoaps, pull out the prograde, keep on it until the apoaps and periaps swing around the planet. And there you go, that gets you a pretty circular orbit. It's, I've gone a bit over circular, but I can't be bothered fiddling with it to get it perfect here because this is just a demonstration flight. I'm not actually doing anything with it. Um, so yeah, but we are now in space, so let's get pointed in the right direction and fire up. You'll find that a lot of uh, space planes have a tendency to nose up a bit in space because of the off-center mass, because of the tail fin. This one, not too bad on that respect because the tail fin's fairly light and the rapiers have enough uh, gimbling to counteract it. But yeah, now we're up here, solar out. Um, yeah, not much to say about that really. Solar works, RTGs work too if you can't be bothered having to remember your solar, uh, but it's a bit heavier and more expensive. Um, and what have we got left in terms of delta V? So yeah, about a thousand meters, that's plenty enough for any sort of orbital rendezvous. It's also good for a medium orbit satellite deployment, speaking of which, let's deploy a satellite. So open up the cargo bay there, come back inside for our cargo bay officer's duties. So he's got his little screen there and push. There we go, cruising out nicely. See the nice smooth release you get from the uh, uh, docking port instead of the uh, decoupler? So let's go out to our satellite. I want to show off what you can do with these things. Um, a lot of people don't get just how insanely good really small, really light probes are. So this is basically just you know, solar panels, battery, a probe core, antenna, thermometer, and the smallest possible uh, monoprop tank with a pair of the uh, monoprop engines. And I just want you to see just how much kick this thing gets out of that tiny amount of thrust. So keep an eye on the space plane in the background as I fire up the engines. Just watch the speed at which it departs. And push. Oop, there we go. Okay, yeah, so that's about uh, 10 Gs of thrust. And sure, yeah, you don't have a huge amount of fuel in the tank in terms of seconds, but when you're cranking along at 10 to 15 Gs, you don't need to keep the throttle on for very long. So, yeah, okay, engine's off, already hit escape velocity. Well on the way out of Kerbin. Um, there we go, so where's... Uh, oh, I didn't even pay attention to what angle I was going at when I fired that up, so it's not going to be an ideal escape, but, okay, it was pointing fairly retrograde along Kerbin orbit, so it's brought us in uh, to about, what is that, uh, Eve? Not sure. Um, but, yeah, we've still got the tanks a bit better than half full. So, hmm, what's that get us in delta V terms? Uh, yeah, so about two kilometers a second worth of delta V still. So let's fire it up again and see just how close in can you get if you burn the entire tank on one of these things. I'm not sure if you can hear that in the background, but it's summer in Australia, so there's a fair bit of cicada noise happening in the background. But anyway, we're out of fuel, um, and yeah, down well inside Moho. So, yeah, one small RCS tank will let you go pretty much anywhere you want in the solar system, and at a 
second small RCS tank, and you'll have a few thousand Delta V to play with when you get there as well. Um, so, yeah, small monoprop probes, very good. Uh, if anything, those little uh, monoprop thrusters are a bit overpowered. They probably need some uh, balancing. The, the massless nature of them is a bit too useful on really light things. Um, anyway, let's close up the cargo bay and think about going home. Just so I can demonstrate how to land this thing. You'll notice my, my graphics have gone a bit finicky there. Um, I, I had removed the clouds part of uh, environmental visual enhancements because I was recording something for a challenge um, and the clouds were getting in the way. But then when I put it back in, the clouds went a little bit weird in places. Um, I've, I've got it fixed now, but I just pulled everything and rebuilt it. Uh, anyway, let's get around the other, uh, well, not quite the opposite side of the planet. If you're going for a really super ultra gentle shallow re-entry, then yeah, you'll do it from opposite your target. Um, but partly because space planes can handle a bit of steepness, and also because uh, I don't have daily re-entry on this at the moment, I'll shave the time a bit shorter and come in relatively steep from about a third of the way around, so that does. There we go. So I'll leave my uh, orbital vector hitting the ground just past the uh, KSC. And there you can see the really weird effect of Eve going berserk. So uh, Copen appears to be have been invaded by some sort of planet-eating interplanetary cheese. Um, so, yeah, presumably there's an army of Kerbals out there with gigantic truckloads of crackers behind them coming through and trying to eat it off the continents. And yeah, you can see the little gaps wiggling back and forth down there as the hungry, hungry Kerbals are desperately battling against the onrushing wave of alien cheese. Um, yeah, but anyway, so let's get ourselves turned around the right way. And can hurry that up past the endless fields of cheese until we hit the atmosphere again. So, I'll just leave the nose pointing down in pretty much the right way we want to go there. Not quite that steeply, we don't need to point directly at KSC. So, yeah, for re-entry, it's, okay, it depends a great deal on what you're flying and on whether or not you're flying with deadly re-entry involved. Uh, but generally what you want to do is just point your nose pretty much at the direction you're flying, but just a little bit above it, like the same 5-10 degrees, the same sort of distance you'd use from prograde if you were doing a gravity turn coming up in a rocket. Um, and just gradually pull the nose up as you go and aim to level out just before you get to the altitude at which you cook, or at pretty much whatever altitude you want if you're uh, not flying with deadly re-entry, although you, even without DRE you still need to worry about aerodynamic failures and um, extreme high dyma dynamic pressure, so you still do want to pull up a bit earlier, but as I mentioned before, the... Uh, how the boys doing? Yeah, Bob looks like he needs a shave. Uh, been up in space for a but oh, remarkably cheerful. You normally don't see Bob that happy. You must be very glad to be coming home. Um, anyway, what was I saying? Uh, oh yeah, the new skin drag in frame, etc. You can see I'm dropping speed very rapidly. I'm still up at 35,000 metres. Uh, before the latest change, you'll hit 30,000 at about Mark 7 still. Whereas now, I'm getting a little bit of visible heating here, but long before it would get dangerous, even if I had deadly re-entry in, I'm going to be slowed down to a safe point. Okay, and big wobble there, because I had it on maximum time acceleration. And also because of one other reason. Um, okay, I'm recording this post commentary, and there's a thing that's about to happen that has got absolutely nothing to do with the design of the plane. And if I had been recording this live, I would shortly start talking about possible things I've got wrong with the design of the plane, how I might fix it when I get back home. It was a pure piloting error. So have a look around the screen, see if you can see my piloting area yet. Um, it's not going to take real effect for a little while, but yeah, so we'll just follow us as we come down now. You can see there's a lot of visual flash and flame, but you can see we've dropped down below Mark 5 already, we're getting down into quite normal speeds. Um, but I'm trying to pull the nose up a bit here, just because I'm noticing the dynamic pressure is getting high, so I want to 
keep it up a bit, but the plane, well, like that, is not behaving properly. Instead of pulling the nose up smoothly, it's doing these massive 10, 15G surges, which fortunately it's tough enough to handle. Um, but yeah, so it's also starting, you could look at the pitch indicator on the left, it's bobbling up and down like a crazy thing, getting massive pitch oscillation, a bit of vol wobble as well, and it's generally flying very, very badly. Um, okay, if your plane does do this, and if it's not the cause I'm about to explain, um, then it may be a, a fuel misbalance thing, it may be uh, excessively overpowered control surfaces, and this does have a lot of uh, control power, so I was starting to think about that, but yeah, this is still me poking around, having a look, trying to figure out what's going, getting a nice little, I like having a little bit of the fuselage visible in the camera so you get to see the glow effects. Um, anyway, so we're charging on in, wobbly wobbly wobbly, down to, you know, Mark 3 and a bit, so perfectly safe speeds, although, you know, dynamic pressure is a little bit high, but no big deal if I was flying normally. Uh, but as you can see, we're continuing to pitch and yaw and buck and wobble, um, but over in the distance, on the horizon, you can see the mountains that are the mountains just to the west of KSC. So if I can, it's, it's flying ugly, but it's controllable. So if I can just hold it together until I get over the mountains and get it down, then Lord Bold and Bob will be able to have a little investigation, try and figure out what's wrong with their plane. Um, okay, so if, have you spotted what the mistake is yet? Okay, take a look, if, if you may have, but if you haven't, take a look down to the left of the nav ball. I've still got it on the prograde instead of stability assistance. So not only is it trying to hold the nose on the prograde vector, so any time I pull the nose up, it's pulling the nose back down again, the PID tuner I use, the thing built into Kerbal Pilot Assistant that uh, controls the sensitivity of your SAS, only works on the stability assistance mode. It doesn't work on the prograde and other modes. So I'm now, not knowing it, flying with an untuned SAS again. So it's massively overcorrecting. Uh, everything I do, um, which is what's making the plane wobble back and forth and side to side, and causing a lot of general unpleasantness as I'm trying to fly. Um, but yeah, so you can see, fortunately I've still got enough speed on, and this is a very high lift plane, it's got good big wings, um, so it, it's not that hard to keep the nose up and keep flying even though it's trying to pull my nose back to prograde all the time because I'm maneuverable enough that I can pull the prograde vector up uh, above the horizon rather than getting constantly pulled down but because it's holding me on prograde I've got this constantly redeveloping dive because any plane point pointing directly at where it's going is going to dive that's just how they work they always need a little bit of angle of attack uh, have the nose pointing a little bit above the direction of travel um, in order to generate some lift and keep flying. This is why an overly stable plane turns into a lawn dart because it just locks its nose onto the direction of travel and then goes down. You need to be able to hold the nose a little bit above, which is what I'm trying to do here. But again, I'm getting these wobbles and massive G surges because I still haven't noticed that the SAS is in the wrong mode. Um, so yeah, here's me getting desperate, trying to alter my SAS tuning to see if that fixes it without realizing that because I'm not in stability assistance mode the SAS tuning is having no effect on it whatsoever. Um, so effectively all those numbers on that thing you just saw there are acting as if they're three times as high as what I've set. Um, so things are getting nasty there. What do I try next? Um, hmm trying to remember what I went through. I think my next attempt was either autopilot or fuel transfer. Um, don't know, but you can see we've slowed down enough woo, that I've got the turbo jet back on to keep us going. Um, but yeah, and this is also taking a bit of time um, because I can't afford to use any time acceleration. If I didn't have my SAS mistake happening right now, this could happily cruise at you know, three or four times time and we'll be well, back at KSC already by now, but as you saw, any time I try and do that, the thing goes berserk and threatens to explode in mid-air. Um, so yeah, we'll try and transfer a bit of 
fuel from the rear tank to the forward tank. Uh, you can see these fuel pumping options. I've got a uh, good speed enabled on this just because it makes things a bit simpler, but I'm not doing anything there that you couldn't achieve without the mod with just a bit more hassle. Um, but yep, pumping the fuel forward had absolutely no effect because, again, even though I haven't realised it yet, the problem with the plane has absolutely nothing to do with the fuel balance. Um, so I think... Uh, is this a... It may be getting to the point where I'm just saying, sod it, let's just fly the thing home and figure it out later. Um, but yeah, we're nearly there anyway. It's not too far to the uh, mountains. And got some nice clouds, wispy clouds to fly through. But yeah, you can see it's another good thing with okay, that line and circle out on the horizon is from Kerbal flight indicators. They just project your prograde and horizon markers out onto the view. Um, and one of the good things about them, not just because they make it a lot easier to tell where you're going when you're flying, is because they do the retrograde projections as well. You can monitor yourself even if you're looking backwards quite easily, you know. As soon as your prograde behind you, well, your retrograde behind you gets above the horizon, that means you're going down. Okay, here we try another desperate solution of turning on the Kerbal Pilot Assist and Autopilot, um, which I normally don't use that much, and especially not at low altitude, because I've, because I don't use it much, I never got around to tuning its own PID values, which are slightly different from the SAS ones. So it's a little bit wobbly if used at low altitude. And it's also particularly not going to work here because it doesn't play nicely with having the stock SAS set onto non-stability modes such as it is right now, despite me not having realised it, despite that being hidden from my view at the moment because pilot assistance is hiding those uh, buttons. So, anyway. But we're nearly there. We're nearly there. Um, and the plane, though it's ugly, it's definitely controllable. But this is a really good demonstration of why PID tuners are absolutely compulsory if you're going to be flying planes in far. Like, it, it is possible to work around it if you depower your control surfaces heavily and uh, use the far flight assistance toggles and things, but at best you'll get it to the point where it's tolerable. You won't get it to actually good. Whereas uh, PID tuner, once you get it set up right, you can make something fly solid as a rock. Um, so, yeah, forget the census is taking a bit of time, let's go have a look. Lodbold's still looking pretty cheery, and yeah, the view through the cameras is nice. Um, you can see the empty cargo bay there. Um, but yeah, because Bob's a bit panicky, I think we'll set Lodbold up to pilot the landing. So just change the screens over, so yeah, basic primary flight display, main landing view. Uh, landing assistant for vertical speeds and things, etc. You can see uh, uh, down next to the default note ball in the center of middle, you can see our surface speed next to that. So we're still doing a little bit over Mark 1, but oh yeah, very slowly accelerating. Still got the turbo jet on. Um, so yeah, all good to come cruising in, but it is getting pretty bouncy out there. Whoa! I'm just trying to pull the nose up a touch just to keep us over the mountains, but again, I'm getting those massive G surges because of how the SAS is messing me up. And, but yeah, we're pretty above the mountains. But, and again, if the SAS was behaving, I would just point above the mountains and keep going there. Because it's playing up though, I keep having to re-raise the nose. And Bob's looking worried. Bob is looking very worried. This is turning into quite a bumpy ride. And he was so happy in orbit. He was thought he was coming home safe. He thought it was all going to be good. And then he finds himself on this you know, badly suspended roller coaster. So again, you can see the nose has pulled itself down because it's still set to prograde. So I'll just try and pull it back up again, up over the horizon. So that'll get us safely up the mountains. Those mountains are about okay. The peaks are about 5,000 meters tall. There are some kind of 3,000 meter passes um, if you do need to scrape over them in a tight one. But I'm getting impatient, so I'll turn time acceleration on again for a bit. But again, as soon as I do that, the plane tries to explode in the air because I still haven't noticed that the SAS is set to the wrong thing. Lodbulb's looking pretty hopeful. Bob is apparently playing for death. Um, or fearing the off. But yeah, well, got the rapiers back on just to speed it up a bit more. 
since uh, the rate we were slowing down we were going to be pretty much stopped before we got to the mountains. So let's just quickly get ourselves up over, get this done with, get this horrible misbehaving thing landed and you know, we'll go have some snacks and a cup of tea. Uh, but we just have to get over this last little hurdle before we get back to base. Side. Yep, again, nose just over the mountains. Still have to keep pulling it up, keep pulling it up because it keeps pulling itself back down. And yeah, you can see out there we're currently headed for the side of the mountains. Nice view through the clouds though. And we'll just cruise along for a while, but no, no, we do need to pull up again. So we'll pull it up. And yeah, we'll see a problem with not being able to see your dew meter while you're pulling up, especially in a plane this badly behaved. Because there's an unfortunate chance of this sort of thing happening. I'm not telling the plane to do that. Why is the plane doing that? That would be why the plane's doing that. And so around here is where I go, well, there's a bit of wing left on that thing and I could add the wheel too. I could possibly maybe even keep them alive if I get it out of this spin. And that's when I notice that I'm locked on the prograde vector and realize what's happened with the plane. This is why I'm now doing this as a post-commentary because the next minute or two would have had to be entirely language filtered. Um, so we're all good, but well, okay. We're good in that we figured out what happened. That, that's a win for science. It's Less of a win for Lord Bold and Bob, um, but again, so the question is, I've got them locked on prograde, why isn't the cockpit SAS holding itself straight? Remember how I locked off the electric charge as an emergency reserve? We're now separated from the batteries, there's no electric charge in that thing unless I can unlock that, and trying to hit that little red marker while it's wiggling around like this is not easy. But yeah, finally got it. So we can lock back to prograde and start to pull up, but it took a bit too long. You can see the start of the idea. We're starting to pull up, starting to pull up. Uh, wheel out, maybe. No, no. Uh, oh, oof. yeah, nearly had to put the language filter in again then. Um, so yeah, that was an unfortunate end for Bob and Lodbold. Um, rather splattery, but. Because that was due to piloting error rather than design failure, and the point of this video was to test out this design, I think we'll use the magic of Kerbal and have another go at this. Uh, so yeah, this one should be a lot quicker and more straightforward now that I no longer have it on prograde. So, uh, coming back in, much the same. Bum, 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 bum. Yep. Uh, what is there to do? I don't know, I've nearly all talked about everything. Bob and Lodbold are looking happy again. Either they do know that they've just escaped certain death, or they have no recollection of what happened, and therefore have no reason to be upset. This brings up a whole theological thing about, you know, exactly how does Kerbin, Kerbal Resurrection work? Do they retain awareness of their previous lives? Is Gerbil, uh, uh, Gerbil? That's a new one. Uh, is Jebediah the pilot of 5,000 lives who remembers every single rocket crash? And if not, if so, why doesn't he have an absolutely awful case of PTSD by now? Um, maybe he does. Maybe that's why he's smiling and crazy all the time. Um... Although, you know, smiling and PTSD don't go often together that often. But, yeah, that's a bit heavy for this. Um, uh, Wanda Found used to be a psychologist, by the way. Um, but, anyway, let's charge on in again. It's all pretty familiar. We've been there before. Lodbold's looking calm. How's Bob? Bob is about as cheery as I've ever seen him. He, he, he might have even just clapped. He, he goes again. So, yep, that, that is a happy Bob. Something is wrong with the universe. Why is Bob happy? Oh well. Um, anyway, back down, nice and calm and smooth this time. Notice the complete lack of wobble and wiggle. Totally stable. See, this is 
gave me a moment of doubt in my design abilities when this was happening the first time, but no, I know this plane works because I've flown very similar airframes a zillion times before. As I mentioned during design, this is one of my standard airframe shapes. Um, but yeah, so crank up the time acceleration, come zooming in, you can see the mountains there. This should take uh, much less time than the first time around because I'm be doing the whole thing at substantial time acceleration um, and keeping a bit more altitude as well so we won't be losing as much speed to drag. Bum, 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 bum. Nearly there, nearly there. Yeah, Bob is still cheerful. This is miraculous and somewhat spooky. Um, bum, bum. Yep, yep, again, clapping, smiling, happy Bob. I think he definitely remembers his previous death and is, you know, being overcome by joy at avoidance of that dreadful fate. Uh, so, yep, you can see... <coughs> okay, we're getting a bit close to the mountains and also getting a bit offline. So I've brought it back to normal time and I want to turn it around to get us lined up right. And you can see, because the runway's a bit off to the right, we don't want to just point at the runway. I want to actually go a little bit past it to bring that target marker back to the 90 degree because if I do that and then point at it then I'll be coming in in line with the runway whereas if I just point directly at it, uh, the target marker now, yeah I'll be going at the runway but I'll come, be coming at it from the side which makes it difficult to land. Okay, and we'll swing around uh, just to prove that IVA flying is not that big a deal so long as your SAS isn't trying to kill you. Um, and yeah, the view's always nice when you've got that sort of bank angle on. Um, the other reason for uh, doing the steep bank instead of turning more gently is because I want to drop some altitude, uh, but I want to do it without dropping too much speed. Um, so just standing the plane on its wingtip is always a good way to drop some height in a hurry uh, without actually having to, you know, take the drag of putting it into a big dive um, or trying a more rudder-based turn. So, yeah, we're going uh, slow enough and should be getting low enough pretty soon to get ourselves down over the mountain. Bob is still cheery. Yep, yep. He's all happy. Um, yeah, so just bank and pull up. Four or five Gs, that's well within what this plane can tolerate. It's not a super duper aerobatics thing, it's not designed for it. Um, so anything above 10 Gs is getting a bit dangerous, but as you saw during the previous mishap, it can cope with 10 Gs for a while. Um, that The thing that actually killed it, I wouldn't be surprised, if you managed to look at the records, I wouldn't be surprised if that was a 20 G spike or something. So yeah, we got lined up. That's around about there is my favourite little set of passes to fly through. There's The one I'm pointing at right now is the big wide one, but just to the right of it, there's a couple of little skinny things which... Uh, tight enough that you occasionally have to, you know, do it trench run style and, you know, flick your wings sideways at the last second to avoid clipping the cliff face, that sort of stuff. Um, so, yeah, that's quite fun. Um, and I've actually uh running a little race series on the challenge threads at the moment, one of which is basically come up and do a very tight spin around that tight spire you can see in the window in front of us um, before getting back to KSC, and there's uh, some cliffs in the background, so you have to slow down to subsonic and then pull a sustained 15G turn to make it. It's quite fun, um, but has a you know, high price in Kerbal casualties. Uh, da -da 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 -da. I think we really do need to investigate the metaphysical nature of Kerbal Resurrection. It's It may change the entire approach to the game. Just how much do the little dudes suffer when they die? Do they remember their fate? Um, anyway, so... Okay, you can see on the big tall peak, uh, well, the really pointy one, just to the right of where I'm pointing, um, uh, the two little tight passes are just in there to the right, and this one I'm going at, although it looks fairly narrow, it's actually pretty wide and easy. This is kind of the cargo plane pass. Um, so it's, it's fun to zoom through these just for a little buzz at the end of a long orbital run, uh, but this, the more practical point is this is also where you'll get through if you're out of fuel and gliding, uh, because you know, every bit of altitude is precious. So you may not be able to get up above the mountains, but you may be able to get through them at times. Um, which is always fun. I, I quite like those missions where you miscalculate and end up having to glide halfway around the planet to get home. It's always stressful. Um, 
you know, trying to get your glide path right and avoid doing any maneuvers that cost you speed and just maximize every last meter. I've had a few where, you know, I, I plonked a big plane onto the first meter of the runway just as it slowed down so much that it was about to fall out of the sky like a rock. Um, it's, it's quite satisfying. Anyway, a bit of low cloud over the mountains, which is fine. I do like the the cloud mods are also fine because okay, sometimes they overdo it a bit, and it seems to be always overcast on Kerbin. Uh, but coming roaring down from orbit through a dense cloud bank, and then you know having a mountain right in your face as you pop out of the clouds and having to pull up hard is also fun. I, I like recreating those you know bad movie scenes. Um, so, yeah, we're nearly through here. You can see the radar altitude down uh, to the left of the nav ball. So even though we're 5Ks up, we're only 2K above the mountains, and that's going to drop sharply for a bit. Uh, wiggle wings there. Uh, yeah, f uh, 300 metres. That's close enough. Um, OK, that roll to get the wings clear was probably unnecessary. The mountains are usually a bit further away than they look, but it's fun to do even when you don't need to. Um, and just rolling down the face of the mountain here in angle with it before we pull up a touch. I want to get the clouds are making it a little bit hard to see exactly where KSC is. So I want to get down just below the cloud layer so I can see where I'm going. Uh, you can see down below the terrain scatters and things on. This is all, uh, I, I recently fixed up my old computer that was absolutely dreadful. So. For 90% of the time I've been playing Kerbal, um, I've had the graphics on minimum settings, a bare minimum of mods installed, and every single time that I quick-loaded or reverted, or many other occasions, the game would crash. I spent nearly as much time starting the game up as I did actually playing it, but uh, I've just had my com computer fixed up, so it's now running absolutely beautifully, and I'm going a bit overboard on the the visual pretties. And so I've got the graphics cranked up, and the ground scatters on, and the uh, environmental visual enhancements in for the clouds and everything, and I, I'm quite enjoying it. It's very nice. Um, but yeah, you can see there we've got KSCs finally coming in range. Uh, we're probably about oh, 25, 30 kilometers away. Drop down to subsonic, and losing some altitude. You do want to come in as low and slow as possible. Like it's possible to do a steep flare sort of landing, but it, it's tricky and it's unnecessarily hard. Um, the simplest way to do landings, especially if you're having a bit of difficulty with them, is just get lined up, you know, get that target marker, and that's, I've, I've got a plane parked at the end of the runway so I can put that target marker there. Um, a flag will do as well. Uh, get the target marker, bang on 90 degrees, get yourself bang on 90 degrees, then get as low as you can, as slow as you can. Um, you want to get it to the point where you can just kind of drop the plane out of the sky onto the end of the runway from about 10 metres up. <laughs> So I'll pull the nose down here. So yeah, this is another bit where uh, Kerbal Flight Indicators, that little marker in the view, comes in very, very handy. Because you can just put that circle before the runway, get down to the altitude you want, then pull up a bit, and then put that circle right on the end of the runway. And that's your glide path sorted. Um, it's also good just for teaching you how to fly, because as, as you're flying around, watch the circle. and do some maneuvers, like you use the ailerons and the rudder and the elevators all in you know, various combinations and you get a much better idea of what effects uh, bank and yaw and such actually have on where you go because you can see the little ball move in response to your inputs. <laughs> okay, yeah, so we're down within 20k now which is you know, pretty much right home. Um, I'm well, we're getting a little bit of SAS wobble just because we're getting into the really low altitude thicker air and we're still doing, even though this seems crazy slow by Kerbal standards, the speed we're doing at the moment is about as fast as a Spitfire or Messerschmitt 109 could go in its fastest dive. So this is not slow. This is a World War II fighter plane going absolutely flat out. You know, a, a Stuka dive bomber in full dive is you know, about this. Um, and But for us, this is our this feels like a bus slow walking speed. Um, all a bit spoiled by Mark V. Anyway, so it's all lined up nicely. Got the wings good and level. And game's starting to fritz out a bit here as we're getting closer to the ground and getting all the terrain scatters and the ocean and the KSC loading as well. Okay. Da -da 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 -da. 
this okay this wiggle up and down it's partly the SAS and it's partly me just constantly tapping pitch just to stop it from because the the prograde is even without any SAS wobble or control inputs as we slow down from air drag that prograde vector is going to come down further further towards us and I'm trying to keep it you know around about the end of the runway but now okay deploy air, deploy air brakes and take a look at my flight speed these things work insanely well you just stop like a rock you can pretty much fall out of the sky um, in the previous versions of Ferrum air brakes they were possible but they didn't have a lot of effect in the latest versions they're very effective um, especially on lighter aircraft if you make a little light thing like that uh, you know aerobatic jet I was demonstrating the other day uh, you can use them as again like Stuka style air brakes uh, dive brakes where you just deploy them put yourself into a full dive and stay at quite a reasonable speed as you plummet um, so that could be interestingly useful once a uh, multiplayer comes along um, yep landing gear down cruising on in uh, what we got heights down yeah but you want your height well below a thousand meters by the time you're this close to the runway I'm actually a little bit high uh, which is why I'm just putting it into a quick little dive here just to drop some altitude get it down to 100 meters or so You do have to watch out coming in because um, the the ground. Once you get to the paddock bit, then the ground's perfectly flat around KSC. But up until now, it's actually quite hilly and bumpy. So it is possible if you come in too low to accidentally clip a hilltop or something. So about 100, 200 meters is where you want to be on your final approach. Um, yeah, so kind of 200 meters over the serious green down to 100. Uh, once you're under the actual KSC paddock, it breaks out again which again you can see they're slowing me down at a fairly extreme rate um, just a little bit of lineup correction I do have wheels out already although you can't see in quite here okay and if I just leave it alone here with you know, a tiny bit of pitch up at the end a gentle landing then that would have been fine but I had to go and put the airbrakes on which knocked me out of the sky like a stone so quite bouncy there that was not entirely intentional but uh, it's fully controllable and with the air brakes and the wheel brakes going as well now I can slow down in quite a short distance on the runway um, but yeah this is a long way from my prettiest landing in fact it's possibly one of my all-time ugliest um, but it's perfectly functional you know fortunately there's a little bit of extra tarmac over that side uh, so here we go Bob Lodbald safely back down eventually and design confirmed. It's a good airframe, it works, it gets to orbit and back, plenty of spare fuel and good cargo capacity. So that one should be yeah, quite useful to you in your career game. So happy days for Bob and Lodbold the second. See you next time guys.